Praise the Lord and welcome again. Welcome to our current edition of our series of daily broadcasts, which we have tagged the State of the Union, the union between Jesus and his bride, the church. And we are still about the business of the word of the Lord saying, tell my people to return to me. So our business is still the matter of the focus on the Lord, returning our focus to him. Like the psalm said in Psalm 16 verse 8, I have set the Lord before me always. And because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Now we may not immediately understand or see the weight or the gravity in that statement. It is far reaching But it will take for us to take some moments to consider it. I have set the Lord before me always. And since he is by my right hand, I shall not be moved. So my confidence is in him. Because I know that I have made him my focus, I can't be moved. Because he can't be moved. And he will defend his own. Now today, I want us to hear in a direction or in a direction perhaps different different in construction if you like from what we have been doing in telling God's people to return to him now in first Timothy in first Timothy chapter 6 Reading, for the sake of time, let us start from the second verse. You will always do well to read everything. But for our purposes and for the sake of time, let us limit ourselves to the most critical parts for, of Acts of, of First Timothy chapter 6. It says from verse 2, and they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supporting, uh, supposing that gain is godliness. And it says, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. You see, it's very easy to take off on a tangent and begin to talk about godliness with contentment is great gain. And maybe we should. Or someday we will return to it. 
but it is perhaps an integral part of our business for now, which is captured in verse 5. In the very first words of verse 5, it says, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such we draw thyself. You know, we have understood this piece of scripture, 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, supposing that gain is godliness. But godliness with contentment is great gain. You know, we have, we have given this piece of scripture a very narrow definition or understanding because of that simple four-letter word, gain. We have understood the word gain to mean, as it were, material prosperity. You can even stretch it to mean making a profit in business. It's still called gain. We have been very narrow in limiting it to material things. But let's read it again, because that word is used in a context. It says from verse 2, and they, and they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. So the writer is trying to set forth doctrine. He's trying to set forth what to teach. So he says these things teach and exhort. Then he goes on, if any man teach anything else, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud. Now it is this person or people which verse 5 describes as perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds who suppose that gain is godliness. So the first business is to correct the impression or supposition that this is about gain. It is not about gain. It is about correct doctrine and therefore perversions of men of corrupt minds. So, the writer starts to set forth what is acceptable. He said these things teach and exhort. And our business is not necessarily today in the specifics of what is to be taught, but rather in the general things of what should be taught, taught and, 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 and what is acceptable doctrine. Now, if you watch verse 5, he uses the word perverse. It says, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. These are the people who refuse to teach wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. But they teach something else. And that something else, the Bible is referring to as perverse. And it is coming from men of corrupt minds. So, so the perversion is veering away from wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the topic. 
perversion of men of corrupt minds. Pervers teachings of men of corrupt minds. It is from this that the Lord is asking us today to turn away and return to him. But we have to understand what the nature of this perversion is. So the writer gives an example using gain and supposing it to be godly or to be godliness. So what is gain? We can understand gain as profit. We can also understand gain as getting an advantage. Getting the advantage. Getting ahead. Doing something for yourself which would be acceptable or which will advance your cause. Now when we understand it like that, it is no longer just a reference to your pocket or to some kind of financial or material gain. Why is this critical? Because the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says, whosoever shall come after me, that is, whoever wants to follow me, he gave the first prescription as let him deny himself. So, Anybody who preaches anything different from self-denial, that's one, or anything which seems or appears to give credit, advantage, or gain to the self, is in error. It becomes perverse because a critical and cardinal requirement of following the Lord is that you deny yourself. Now, if you are denying yourself, how can you be talking about gain? Because gain is about the self. The business of the Lord in asking us to deny ourselves is one of self-sacrifice. So you can't be talking about gain when you are in the business of sacrificing yourself. Unless the gain in self-sacrifice is first advanced. That's the real gain then, not the gain of advantaging yourself. Can I say that again? 1 Timothy 6, 2 to 6, as we have read, is talking about wholesome words versus, that is, what we should be teaching as doctrine versus perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. You see, this is because the word of the Lord says, tell my people to return to me. Now, if we are going to return to him, then we must return to correct doctrine. We must return to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. His words must once again determine, undergird what we do. Anything else becomes a perversion. And whoever is involved in that is of a corrupt mind. Now, when we understand that, then you can easily see the error in what we have done with the word blessing and the word prosperity. 
we have taught those two words in the context of advantage for the self. That's not according to the word of the Lord. Because he said, whosoever will follow him should first of all deny himself. Or if you like, forsake himself. Now, if you are going to deny yourself or forsake yourself, it means you are going to take yourself out of the picture. You are going to take yourself out of the equation and the only thing that will be left is, you say, I want to follow Christ. Where Christ says, to follow me, you take yourself out of the equation. So the equation of, I want to follow Christ, if, I, if Christ says, take yourself out of that equation, then the equation is left with what? Follow Christ. You see what I'm saying? So he says, if you are going to follow me, take yourself out of the equation. Now, once you take yourself out of the equation, gain to you will be Christ. Now, do you see what Paul meant in Philippians chapter 3? He said, whatever I had, I now consider it but dung that I may gain Christ. That I may follow after Christ. So, whoever is teaching personal gain, for example, that is, in Christ, that that gain itself is not growing in the Lord, but rather growing in the self under the guise of Christ, is perverse. He says, deny yourself. Then he says, take up your cross. In other words, if you are going to follow Christ, the first requirement is take yourself out of the equation, number one, and then be ready to suffer whatever inconvenience may come your way in following Christ. That's the self-sacrifice. Take out yourself. Be ready to sacrifice yourself. That's like tautology. Repeating himself. And then come and follow me. Take yourself out of the equation. Develop a mindset that is ready to sacrifice self. Then come follow me. Because, he didn't say, but I say, in following me, you are going to end up sacrificing yourself. Why? Self-sacrifice is virtually the hallmark of Christ. Otherwise, why did he go to the cross for sins that he didn't commit? Why did he go to the cross to die for somebody else? He gave his life away that somebody else might, somebody else might have life. Self-sacrifice. So, the author in 1 Timothy 6, we know that it is the Apostle Paul. But I don't want to make reference to him right now because we are reading those words as the word of God. So the word of the, God, the, word of the Lord teaches us in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that there are wholesome, acceptable words, desirable words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he refers to them as the doctrine which is according to godliness. Godliness. Returning to God. Bringing God back into focus. Making God the focus. When God becomes or begins to be our focus, we said in a previous broadcast, we start to lose sight of ourselves. We start to lose sight of everybody else. We start to lose sight of everything else. We start to lose sight of even our immediate surroundings. And so it becomes all God. And therefore, whatever he wants or whatever he's presenting to us. So he says, whoever teaches otherwise 
is proud knowing nothing and he considers their teaching perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds something has corrupted their thinking and so their words have become perverse what is the meaning of this word perverse or some might say perverse like you say pervert so I looked it up both in the Bible language dictionary and then in the ordinary dictionary of the English language in the Hebrew it refers to something precipitate so I looked up the word precipitate and it means something that is undesirable so I looked up the word perverse in the English dictionary and it simply gives another single word unacceptable so it seems to my mind the Bible is referring to something that is unacceptable or undesirable as doctrine from the standpoint of godliness from the standpoint of God from the standpoint of even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ he gave the standard himself anything which veers from that is perverse and once there is a perversion it will be required of men to return to God to return to wholesome words to return even to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ <laughs> now having set that as a backdrop in days to come the Lord willing the Lord being gracious unto us, we will begin to look at perhaps one area or the other where we have worked in perversion. I already gave one example, and that's because the scripture already used it as an example. Supposing that gain is godliness. The only type of gain in godliness is that you be advanced in Christ. That we grow to the fullness of the stature of the measure of Christ. Not material advantage of any sort, whether financial or social. Christ or nothing else. This is the standard. This is what we are called to. So when God says, tell my people to return to me, let us understand. We are not returning to him just in him sickness, but even in doctrine, even in the things which we teach. Even in the things which we teach. So what happened to the church the moment we started to preach blessing and material gain in Christ? What happened to the church? The church stood still or even regressed in Christ but got bigger in size, got bigger in body, if you like, got bigger materially. But we stopped growing in Christ. We sacrificed material gain. We sac material gain, I'm not just money, material gain, that is gain that the eyes can see. We sacrificed growth in Christ for material gain because there was a perversion. Because there was a perversion. Somebody taught us that the way to see that a man is blessed 
is in his material prosperity. Supposing that gain is godliness. Does that mean that God does not bless men? You know that he does. But Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That ought to be the focus. The righteousness of God is in Christ. It's revealed in Christ. So if we are seeking the righteousness of God, we are going to end up seeking Christ. He said, and all these things, all these things which we imagine to run after, but which we shouldn't, because the Gentiles are the ones who should be running after those things. He said, now all these things will be added to you. But get your priorities. Get your ducks in line. Get your ducks in line. Get your priorities straight. Now, quickly. In a minute or two, let's take up another piece of scripture. It says in Acts chapter 20, verse 29. It says, of course, we know that it is the same human writer that is writing, the same Paul, the apostle. It says, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of yourselves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn every night, every one of you, night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. What's Paul saying by saying, now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace? Because that is where we ought to be. He shows us the way out to the imbroglio that he referred to in the two previous verses. That after his departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. They have. The false prophets and false teachers, perverse men of, uh, 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 men of, of, well, perverse men, let me see. Men of corrupt minds have entered in among the flock, and they have not spared the flock. And then he says, even among yourselves. Now, this is not men coming in from outside. He says, for even among yourselves shall men arise speaking things they ought not to speak. Speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Why are they doing what they do? For the sake of gain. In other words, one thing one factor about their perversion or perverseness is the fact that they have started to seek gain. They want to draw disciples after themselves, not Christ. So the picture has changed. Now what do you think? What kind of people do you think people who pursue gain will produce? You will produce people who pursue gain. So these people appeared in the church speaking perverse things, things which are not according to the wholesome words of our Lord Jesus Christ about the business of self-sacrifice and self-denial. So I asked the question the other day, what were we called to in Christ? A life of laughter and merriment and enjoyment and comfort? Really? 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 Is that what you think we are called to in Christ? Really? No, really? But because of these perversions, we have taken the provisions of God for the work. And we have consumed them upon ourselves. 
It's not. It's nothing new. He already said that. We saw that scripture yesterday in James chapter four, verse three. That you want to consume what you get upon your lusts. So when the gain or the increase comes, one of the first things we do is to put some ease in our stride. Like they say, to put some ounce in our bounds. So we begin to get comfortable. We begin to own big houses and to build big cathedrals because we know that that's how men will reckon us as successful. Why? We want to draw men after ourselves. He says, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn you every night and day with tears. He said, but now I commend you to our God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, to build you up. The word of God is able to build you up, not material gain. Now here is the perversion. There are people who have come and who have taught us about gain for self. And the Bible calls their way perverse, unacceptable, undesirable from the standpoint of our God and the word of his grace. And if it is the word of his grace and we understand about the word of God's grace, then we understand that there's nothing about self-help. And if it is not about self-help, it cannot be about self. So how did it become about self? How did self get into the picture that has caused us to turn away from God? For which God is now saying, tell my people to return to me. We'll begin to answer some of these questions and much more. And speak about wholesome words and doctrines which we ought to teach in the matter of tell my people to return to me in the coming days. But I must stop here. And God bless you as we consider these things, as we consider the business of wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, as against perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds who have entered the church teaching men things which ought not to be taught anywhere near Christ. See you again tomorrow and the days to follow and the days to follow and even the days to follow and even the days to follow as we look at these things so that indeed we can return to the place for which Christ died. God bless you.